This is Sky Sports, a part of the British Sky Broadcasting Network. everybody and welcome to Phoenix, Arizona, more specifically Firebird International Raceway for the International Hot Boat Association World Finals. We'll be calling it the IHBA throughout the day, but this is the first time that the World Finals have ever been televised, so it's going to be a learning process for all of us, and we think you'll get some information along the way, and we'll even have some fun too. I'm Mike Chamberlain, and joining me with this expert commentary today is Dan Nagy. Dan, first of all, it's a little bit windy here in Phoenix today, and I'm curious what the wind will do to these boats. Yeah, Mike, we've got a little bit of wind, a little bit of cloud cover which keeps the temperatures down, which is good for these engines. The engines like the high horsepower, which the cool temperatures induce, and with a little bit of wind, it puts a little chop on the water and it frees the boat up. So I think we can see some world record passes today. We will also check in throughout the day with KC Winkler. She's going to go behind the scenes and bring us some of the flavor that makes up the world finals. Well, I'm up in the grandstands at the IHBA. I'm overlooking the racetrack. I, I mean, when I'm down at the bottom of the stands, I'm not more than about 75 feet away from the water. And believe it or not, it's early, and the fans are already here. They're lining up, and they're waiting for a great day of racing. I've been through the pits a little bit, and I hear them starting up, and the engines are roaring. And I'll tell you, my heart's pounding, and I'm ready for a great day. The Top Fuel Hydro's Quarter Flash and Spirit of America are moving their boats to the launching ramp to kick off the first round of competition. Now, earlier this morning, Dan Nagy had a chance to talk with Fred Bray, the owner of the Spirit of America, about what a Top Fuel Hydro's all about. Well, actually, the three, this is actually a three-point hydroplane. It's called a twin sponson, where you have one sponson on each side at the front. It also rides at the back of the boat on the bottom third of the propeller, and therefore you have your three points. So you actually ride on a cushion of air down the quarter mile. And uh, the horsepower and the weight of the boat, what are we looking at here? Well, ours is a top field hydro. You know, you're talking about 4,000 horsepower. This thing runs on an exotic blend of nitromethane, and it develops over 4,000 horsepower. Therefore, you can, you know, you can look for speeds in excess of 200 miles per hour in just about every, you know, dual competition. Do you think 200 miles an hour is capable here today? No, I think that you're going to see over 200. You saw a 221 yesterday. You saw a 216, a 219. I think today you'll probably see a 222 or maybe three. That was Fred Bray, the owner of the Spirit of America. Let's put this boat in the water with its driver. The driver is Kyle Walker. We're going to show you a replay from one of the earlier qualifying runs today. There seemed to be some handling problems in this one, Dan. Well, Mike, looks like it took off with a real good start. Right there about half track, looks like it might have misfired in the engine, which gave the boat a little bit of gill handling. He drove through it, and Kyle Walker, being a veteran, had a nice pass. And keep in mind now, Kyle Walker placed second at the 1990 IHBA World Finals last year. He's never won the World Finals, and maybe because of little problems like this. Well, Mike, uh, Kyle's being a veteran. He's just trying to hang on the run and make the best he can. I think in all models, he's really good pass. And towards the end, though, Dad, too much bounce, too much bounce on that boat on the water. Yeah, usually a, a rookie driver might have got out of it, but Kyle, knowing driving by the seat of his pants, can really drive right through. Well, the team got their act together in the last qualifying run. The Spirit team able to work out their engine problems. He was the fastest qualifier with an elapsed time of 5.403, 216 miles per hour. Ralph Padilla out of Yorba Linda would be Kyle's big competition on this day. This is Padilla in the near lane with the fastest qualifying run, 202 miles per hour, an elapsed time of 5.98. Dan, this has got to make Porter Flash the underdog in this match race. Well, true, Mike. Kyle's really running well this weekend. Um, Ralph hasn't been to the winner's circle yet this year. I think he's really swinging for this race. Um, this is Ralph's second year in Top Fuel Hydro, but I think he's looking real good today. Kyle Walker in the spirit of America making their way out to the starting line. Notice they use kind of a tow rope. We'll tell you more about that a little bit later on. We talked with the crew chief of this team. His name is Kurt Flack about the spirit of America. How's it going this week? Things looking good? How you feeling? Uh, it started out a little rough. We had some problems on our uh, test run on Thursday. We uh, popped the blower on it, but uh, we got it straightened out now, and uh, we're number one qualifier right now. You know, this is not a cheap sport to get into. I'm told these engines can run you up to $30,000 or so. What's it cost to keep this boat afloat? 
Uh, well, you figure the fuel is about $55 a gallon, and we burn about nine gallons a run. Uh, we change oil every run. We change 16 spark plugs every run. Uh, a piston is about uh, $50. Rod's about $50, and sometimes you have to change all of those in one pass. All right, all eight of the top fuel hydros are on the rope getting ready for the first round of racing. Dan, this is the largest field we have ever had assembled for a world final. Mike, I haven't seen an eight-boat field in years. The tension is so thick right here. These guys are ready to go. It's showtime. Well, it is showtime, and I'm wondering what's running through their minds and their stomachs right now. From experience, you can talk about it. What are they What are they feeling like right now? Well, I tell you, Mike, you're looking down that quarter mile, looking at the 30,000 fans in the audience. you got 3,000 horsepower behind your back. You just want to get the show on the road and get it down the racetrack. It amazes me how much work goes into a five-second run. They have prepared all their lives for this five-second run, and they're about ready to go. You're going to see the staging area is all set, and we're about ready to fire in the first round. Well, Mike, we're getting ready to go here. Ralph Padilla versus Kyle Walker. The stager right now is asking both drivers if they're ready. They're ready. Kyle gives the okay sign. He's ready, ready to get going right. here. He's going to light the motor right now. Ralph Padilla the same. The motors are lit. We're looking for the countdown. And Dan, just to add a little bit more drama to this thing, the winner of this race will determine the number two racer in the series overall. So number two is at stake here. Well, here we go, Mike. Kyle Walker from Houston, Texas. Ralph Padilla from Norbalinda, California. They're going. It's a start. Side by side. It's a good race. Kyle Walker getting out of shape. Look at the rooster tail going away. Here comes Padilla hard. Boy, it was a close race, Mike. Looks like Padilla took the win. Yeah, it looked like he actually had it from the start. It looks like he got a quicker start off the line than Kyle Walker. Reaction time's all what's all about in this racing, Mike. They're coming down to an end here. The race is over. What a relief to the driver. As we take a look at some of these replays, I think the, the telling factor will be the rooster tail coming off the back of these boats. We're going to show you a couple of angles. We'll see what we're talking about. It's a good start, Mike. They're side by side. Right there already. Why Kyle Walker's out of shape. He's pedaling the throttle trying to keep it hard. That's what the rooster tail is bouncing up and down. He's pedaling that throttle trying to win this race. He, he can't see Ralph yet, but right there, I think he sees him going by him. And perhaps he was trying to make up for the bad starts. We're told he got off the starting line three tenths of a second after Padilla did, and that is a lifetime when you come down to drag boat racing. Well, it's official. Ralph Padilla taking the win. Look at his aerial shot here. Look at Bruce, Bruce Tail from Kyle Walker's boat. Padilla taking the win a 586 at 205 miles an hour. Kyle Walker running up 587 at 169. You can see the telling effects, the bouncing down the left-hand lane, the smooth line that Ralph Padilla found. And there he is, cooling down right now. Big win for Quarter Flash. We're ready for the second pair in round number one. It is caught in the act with Steve Varner at the helm. Fatal attraction, Clinton Anderson is the driver. So, Dan, you might set it up for us. Who's the favorite? Who's the underdog? Well, Mike, unfortunately, the underdog would have to be Clinton Anderson. He's got two years experience in drag boats. This is his first race in top fuel. And he's up against a heavy veteran, Steve Varner. In the left lane, you'll want to keep your eye on Steve Varner and caught in the act. Varner, a very experienced racer. However, this is his rookie season in the top fuel hydro. Now in the right lane will be Clinton Anderson out of Alpine, California. This is his first race ever in the top fuel hydro class. You talk about nerves, oh my. The canopies are closed, we gotta start. Here we go. Varner, a nice start. Clinton Anderson having some problems. Varner on a straight line. I bet this pass will be well over 200 miles an hour, Mike. Well, we saw Varner, our camera kind of centered on him. What we didn't see was Clinton Anderson just all out of shape from the get-go, could not get that boat on a straight line. And there you see it, the winner right there, Steve Varner, thanks in part to Clinton Anderson having some problems handling that boat. As you can see here, Mike, on the replay, Steve Varner with a nice start and off to a beautiful run. Clinton Anderson getting out of shape in the throttle, very wisely picks it off. And you can see Varner goes on to an easy win here because Clinton Anderson actually shut the boat off halfway down the run. And you've got the official time. Yes, Mike, it is official. Steve Varner with a 558 at 216 miles an hour. Clinton Anderson slowing to an 1180 at 50 miles an hour. And once again, that high angle shot really tells the story. Caught in the act, and Steve Varner have a date in the semifinals. They will meet Porter Flash and Ralph Padilla. We'll have more action when we continue. Welcome back, everybody, to the IHPA World Finals. Dan Nagy is down in the pit to talk with Clinton Anderson. Remember him, the guy that just lost? You'd never know it. Well, this, this event here, we came in, this is our first top fuel event. We wanted to do some learning here. We wanted to get the boat down in a straight line. I wanted to go 200. 
We achieved everything we came here to do. Next year, we're going after it full tilt. So is this really considered the e-ticket ride of drag boat racing? Hey, this is definitely an e-ticket ride. I mean, it is awesome. You cannot imagine the feeling of power you have in a nitro boat. Clinton Anderson, a weekend he'll never forget. The first weekend he sat behind the wheel of a top fuel hydro. Well, these drivers are outfitted in very high-tech, sophisticated driving suits, and our KC is with Bill Flanderoy to talk about the safety features built into these suits. Now, this is Tony. He's a boat driver for the Searchin, and he's wearing the new state-of-the-art uh, equipment that Bill manufactures for the guys that drive in the capsules. What you're looking at here, what we see here, is basically a Nomax driving suit like car racers wear, and now, of course, boat racers wear it. But what we've done with this driving suit for Tony is there's handles right here, and he drives a capsule boat. He's all strapped in like a car racer. So these handles, so God forbid if he gets in an accident, the patrol boats can grab these handles and pull Tony out of the capsule. Then this is the conventional Velcro collar for fire protection. What's he got in, what he, we got inside of here is an actual flotation, rubber flotation, like you have in a ski vest, a water ski vest. And if Tony will turn a little bit, I even put a knit, stretched knit in here for his comfort so that we make these to fit the driver tight because over the top of the suit is a restraint system like a car racer wears, a regular six-point restraint system to hold Tony's body right in that capsule nice and tight. So this is, it's important that people see there's more features of this than meets the eye. For the last 24 years, this is what we specialize in, is the marine safety business. And with the, with the new innovations we're coming up with, we're just doing everything we can to stay up with them. Well, we want to keep these guys safe, right? Right. Thank you, Casey. And Dan is back with me now. Dan, it appears getting the best start off the line is really what it's all about when it comes to drag boat racing. But first of all, to get to the actual staging area, you got to work your way down the tow rope. To me, this is very fascinating. You can bring a $100,000 boat to the line, and then a $12 rope gets you out there. It seems unbelievable to me. Well, Mike, you can see here, it's real easy to get the boat out across the holding rope and you have plenty of time to get down into your boat and get strapped into the cockpit. Let's take a look at the starting system. This is the countdown clock. It starts with a solid red, goes to a 15 second blinking amber, to a solid five second amber, then the countdown begins. This is where the race actually starts. Something else we should point out, Dan, they have what is called an approach area. It's 125 feet long. You can see it in that light yellow uh, area there. Talk about that. Well, Mike, what that approach area is for is on the countdown, you have to time your boat to the starting line right where that yellow area is. You see here Lou Osmond taking a shot at it. No red light, so he was right on the number there, Mike. So in a nutshell, the end of that approach area is actually the beginning of the start line. Right, Mike. You see the numbers come down here? This boat in the right lane, he got across the starting line a little bit too quick, and that's what drew the red light. And if you get a red light, you're what they call DQ, disqualified. Other forms of racing give you a little bit of leeway, but in this sport, sorry. Red light, see you later. Yeah, Mike, your weekend's over. As you can see here, the yellow area is the approach area. The green area is the 1,320 feet liquid quarter mile. The center course is marked by yellow buoys. The outside is marked by red buoys. In this approach area, a driver's reaction time can be a critical factor in winning or losing a race. Well, we're just about set for the finals in the blown alcohol flat bottoms. And I know what you're saying at home. You're saying, Mike, what the heck is a blown alcohol flat bottom? Well, lucky for you, Dan met up with one of the drivers, and he's going to explain it right now. I'm here with Emmett Peluso from San Diego, California. Emmett, you run a blown alcohol flat bottom. Can you tell me the difference between an alcohol flat bottom and a hydro and a jet boat? Well, the, uh, this particular boat's a blown alcohol flat bottom. It's, it's about 18 feet long. It has about 2,000 horsepower that has to be controlled, which differ from our boats than normal boats or hydro is. We have a pedal system, an up and down pedal system. That's the pedals right here to your left? Yes, we have a, the left pedal pushes the cavitation plate down. Okay, uh, and the right and pedal the right brings pedal, the boat up? Well, it just basically stabilizes the plate from being sucked down through the force of the water. Uh -huh. How much of the boat actually rides in the water when you're making a pass? Well, a good, the perfect ride we like to see is on the center plate with no water coming off the sides of the boat at the end of the boat. And this is a blown on alcohol Rodak engine. How much right. horsepower are we putting out here? Anywhere 18, 2,000 horsepower. We try to keep it at that. And what kind of speeds can we anticipate from you today? These are averaging in the 150 mile an hour bracket and in the low, low 70 T brackets.
you might want to look at the blown alcohol flat bottoms as the funny cars of drag boat racing. Maybe that will put it into more perspective for you. We want to take a look back on a qualifying race that featured this guy, Jim Hines, against an Australian named Stan Tyndall. Yes, this is the IHBA World Finals, and they've come from around the world to compete here today. Well, here we go, Mike, in our final qualifying attempt. Jim Hines in the left lane, Stan Tyndall in the right lane. Both engines are running. They're waiting for the staging lights to come down. Tyndall, the man from down under, he's from Wyon Creek, Australia. His boat's called the Aussie Express. He was the IHCA 1991 High Points Champion. And in the left lane, we have Jim Hines. He's from San Pablo, California. His boat's called the Plaything. Last year at this race, he went all the way to the finals, only to red light. Okay, Mike, both boats are staged. We should be getting the green here pretty soon. They're putting them in gear. Here we go. Final qualifying attempt for Tyndall and Hines. They're both off to a nice time. Oh! Tyndall, a red light. Last year's reigning IHBA champion will not qualify for world finals. Boy, that kills me. The guy comes all the way from Australia and then gets a red light, is disqualified. That just doesn't seem right. Oh, Mike, the poor guy, his weekend's over. Jim Hines is already qualified in the field. Poor Stan Tyndall is going to pack his bags up and head on home. We are now set for round one of the eliminations. This one features Rod Corning from La Habra in Wasted Nights. He will go up against a boat. Its name is Cookin, and the pilot is Kurt Stewart. Kurt's from Arcadia, California. This should be an interesting race. Both boats almost qualified exactly the same, mile per hour and elapsed time. Oh, Mike, these are only two capsule boats right, right, in the blown right. alcohol flat bottom class. Kurt Stewart, this is his first time running blown alcohol flat bottom. So he's got to be a little bit nervous at the starting line right now as he continues to maintain that holding rope. The capsule comes down. We are just about set to fire. Okay, Mike, we're going racing here. The lids are down. Green light, we're on it. Whoa, Kurt Stewart gets way out of shape. Has to shut the boat off. Looks like Rod Corning's going to take an easy win this one. It looks to be that Rod Corning has crossed the center line. Kurt Stewart's coming down behind him. Rod Corning is disqualified for going outside of his lane. Kurt Stewart idling down the racetrack. It should be an automatic win. You see here Kurt Stewart taking his time. Oh, look at there. He's pointing out. Rod Corning has disqualified himself. He wants to make sure the officials know it. Well, there you go. If indeed he passed that center line, he will be officially disqualified. We'll get a lot better view this time. Look at it and see what you think. We're keying on Rod Corning here. Boy, I don't know, Mike. It looks like he had some handling problems. He's trying to bring it back right there. Right there, he's disqualified. His weekend is over. Well, you got to believe this was a mechanical breakdown and not a mind problem. There's no way he would steer the boat into that lane. What's interesting is that Kurt Stewart just putt, 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 putt. All he had to do was cross the finish line to get the win, and indeed that happened. Well, Mike, it had to be a mechanical problem, I believe. Rod Corning's a veteran driver. He's won many races. I can't see him doing a mental mistake like that. So this all sets up our final in the blown alcohol flat bottoms. We will have Jim Hines. His boat is called Plaything. And he will be up against Cookin, again piloted by Kurt Stewart. Yeah. This is Kurt's first race in blown alcohol flat bottom. He must be awful excited here to be in the final round against Jim Hines, the heavy veteran in the alcohol flat bottom class, Mike. Left lane ready. Right lane ready. Okay, here we go, Mike. The tree's coming down. This is the blown alcohol flat bottom final. This is for all the money, all the cash, and the title of world finals winner. Here we go. The boats are staged. Drivers are putting them in gear now. This is the finals. Hines against Stewart. They're going. Good start. Hines gets a little loose. Oh! A red light by Jim Hines. The win is going to go to Kurt Stewart in the left lane. His first time in alcohol flat, the world finals title. And here on the replay, you can see Jim Hines coming away from the starting rope, hits on the throttle and hits a little bit too hard. The boat starts to fly, he's going to try to recover to bring it back down. That's what caused the red light. Right here, Kurt Stewart doesn't realize that Jim Hines has red lighted and he's really pushing hard towards the finish line. Mike, Kurt might be feeling a little unhappy right here, but what he doesn't realize is that Hines is red lighted and he took the win. 737 ET at 136 miles per hour.
we're just about set for the third pairing in round number one of the Top Fuel Hydros. It will feature Top Gun and Gary Kincaid against Beautiful Noise and Tom Cantrell. Yesterday, Casey talked with Gary. He's on the verge of a world record. Why don't you tell us what you did, what, what your time was? Well, I went 221.56 miles an hour on my first pass ever in a Top Fuel boat. And what do you got to do to make it a record? I think I got to be within 2% of the record. I think the record's 219 or 220 right now. Looking around here, I'm seeing all this buzzing of activity. Uh, give me a run through of what you have to go through to back up your record tomorrow. Well, what we kind of do is duplicate what we did. We need to make the motor the same as it was, the tune up the same, and I got to drive the boat exactly how I did. And what's that, pedal to the metal and that's all you get? Yeah, that's what I learned. A top fuel boat, you have to plant to the wood the minute you leave the line. And what I've been doing is kind of just rolling the boat out like an alcohol boat, and you can't do that on fuel. It won't, just don't work. We're all going to be watching tomorrow. we got our cameras tuned in, so I just want to wish you lots of luck. I want you to back up that record. I'm going to be out there pulling for you. Thank you very much. Hope I do. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, well, what's interesting to me about all of this, Dan, is the fact that you have to back up your world record in this sport or in drag racing too or the Bonneville Salt Flats, and there's a real good reason for it. Oh, Mike, they just want to make sure it's not a fluke and that you're being consistent. Yeah, but conversely, imagine going up to Carl Lewis after setting a world record and saying, Carl, you've got to do that again. You've got to back it up. Hey, here's what all the to-do was about yesterday. This is Gary Kincaid. He is in the near lane as you're watching the television screen, and you pick it up from here. Well, Mike, this is half of Gary's record run from yesterday. Comes out of the hole real nice. Gets a little bit out of shape right here. He drove right through it. Gary's an experienced driver. Gets on the throttle. What a beautiful pass. He's got a nose really flying down there. Look at that gorgeous rooster tail 200 feet behind the boat. He made that pass yesterday. So today here in first round of competition, he's got to come back in the left lane and back up that record, Mike. Well, the moment is at hand. Gary Kincaid trying to back up that world record from yesterday. Oh, wait a minute, Mike. We have a problem here. Gary Kincaid right now is in the right lane. He needs to be in the left lane to back up that world record. This could be the faux pas of the week. Why? How could that possibly happen? Well, Mike, it's Gary's responsibility to tell the stager, I need to be in the left lane. He has lane choice. He needs to be in that left lane to back up this record. So if he sets a record in this lane, it's not going to count. All right, we have Gary Kincaid. He is in Top Gun out of Riverside, California, and he is up against the boat Beautiful Noise. Tom Cantrell is at the helm out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. The hatches are going down, Mike. We're ready to go here. Top fuel hydros a pair. The tension's in the air. But the problem is Kincaid does not know that he's in the wrong lane, and if he is, he hasn't given any communication to the starter. Here we go. Countdown down, Mike. It's a good start. Both boats are coming out the whole hard. Kincaid, another bunny hop. What a race. Cantrell getting out of shape, shutting it off. Kincaid going through the lights. What a pass. Beautiful. Gary Kincaid taking the win in the right lane. Cantrell just idling through. Well, he wins this race, although it's in the wrong lane. And if I'm not mistaken, he has gone past the shutdown area. He's in trouble. He's up on the embankment, Dan. That's This poor guy's got more problems than you can ever hope to deal with. Mike Rescue's on the way. The boat is on fire. Why, well, I don't know what could have went wrong right here. There you see Gary getting out of the boat. He's okay. Uh, boy, the parachutes are out, but I don't know what went wrong there, Mike. Must have been a mechanical failure. Well, you think you had a bad day at the office. We will talk to Gary Kincaid when we come back. Let's take a break. Welcome back, everybody. When we last left you, Gary Kincaid and Top Gun had run up on the embankment. Our cameraman has caught up with Gary, and here's what went wrong. Um, it actually broke the rudder off right in the mile an hour lights and it broke the two-speed free will the motor and it, what it did essentially is kick two rods out and catch it on fire. With bull shoots out, it's still without the friction of the rudder, it was still going way too fast to stop, so it just went up on the beach. Probably going 85 when I hit the beach, not very fast, but it, the shore's not very good, it's kind of rocky and stuff. So. People want to loan us motor and give us a rudder to run and all that, but it's just too much work and, and uh, we don't need to do no more damage. So you're done? Yeah, we're done for the day. Well, it's time now for the final pairings in the first round of the Top Fuel Hydros. It will be Madness against Performance Plus. Madness piloted by Ron Braxma, Performance Plus by Walt Ott. Now, it really got down to the wire for four-time world champion Ron Braxa. He qualified on his last run yesterday. And Dan Nagy had the opportunity to chat with the defending world champion earlier today. You know, we're just so happy right this moment just to even qualify out here at Firebird. And, uh, you know, it was tough. We'd made six attempts and had handling problems all weekend long. And finally, last minute, last boat to run, last qualifying session, weren't even qualified. We went out there and ran a nice 574, 205, and put a number four qualifier. And uh, we're real happy with that. And, uh, you know, now it's Sunday. 
this is do or die now, and we're going to step on this thing a whole bunch more and see if we can go out there and put some boys away. Ronnie, yesterday when you were on the holding rope, what was going through your mind? You had one shot to defend your title. What can you say about that? We were quite nervous about the whole thing. You know, the whole team's like, uh, we're unqualified here, you know, at the world finals, you know. Uh, we had to qualify to clinch the championship that would sew the deal up. And that's where championship teams come into play, you know, when the pressure's on and it had to happen. This team stepped up, made it happen, and uh, I was real proud when I went to bed last night of all these guys. Dan was kind of interested. He had the chance to talk with him. What do you think his chances are? He had trouble qualifying his chances of defending his title. Well, Ron Broxman's been in this position before, Mike. He, he's been a world champion four times in a row. He's won the world finals from 87 to 90. Ronnie handles pressure well. He knows what he's got to do. He's got the crew with him. He knows how to take care of business, Mike. What I'd like to do is to look back to yesterday's qualifying run. He's had a lot of trouble handling this boat. Well, as you can see here, Mike, Ron's been pulling to the right all weekend long. Right here in his first qualifying pass, he goes right over the finish line buoy. He revamped the boat before this race. He was looking for a world championship charge and a world record. Mike, he's having a tough weekend. But the good news is, is he did qualify and still stands a chance to defend that world title here in Phoenix today. Well, Mike, here he is. He should be up against Walt Ott. Walt Ott did not make the call. He broke the boat in warm-up. Ron Broxmont has a legal single down the racetrack. All he's got to do is get down the racetrack, and he goes right to the final. And here's the countdown. We're going to see it. Here comes the run off to a fairly good start. No, I'll take that back. He floated to the left. Oh, Mike, it was a real bad start. The boat hooked hard to the right, came back to the left. Ronnie don't look like he's very happy right now. He's outside the race course. He's disqualified for the weekend. There goes Ron Broxman's chance for a win here in the World Finals. And that last blast that came off the back of that boat was nothing more than frustration. What a disappointment. One of the sponsors of Madness is Ray Huddleston. He talked about the disappointment today. What seems to be the problem? I would say just uh, it's fate. It's luck. <laughs> you know, everybody says, well, it's really lucky that you get a bye run, and all you have to do is paddle across the starting line. And we're out of the program because it went outside of the first buoy, which is a good rule. Should apply. So it's just a big series of We'd unbelievable. Be in there. Yeah, well, I'm sure. <laughs> just a series of unbelievable consequences. Yeah. Yes, that? yes. Something that you can't really control most of the time. Well, it's out of our hands now. But we're going to have at it next year too. Watch out. That's what. That's the <laughs> attitude we like, Ray. Let's go down to Dan. He is with Walt Ott. Find out what went wrong in that last race. Walt, the first call went out for top fuel high door this morning in the first round, and you didn't make it to the rope. What went wrong? Well, we broke a bearing in the gear drive on the that drives the camshaft for the motor, and it kept us from coming out for first round. So. And that's about what a five dollar part is making. Yeah. Five dollar part kept you out of first round. Yeah, we'd warmed the motor, started it up, everything was fine. We were just backing the motor down, getting it ready, and come up to the ramp, and didn't feel right. We checked it out, couldn't make the call. The blown jets are being called to the staging area. Their final coming up in just a short while. And what is exactly a blown jet? Well, Dan Nagy talked with Roger Way, and he explained it perfectly. The basic difference between a jet boat, like you're looking at now, and a hydro or flat, is that the hydros and flat bottoms are propeller driven. Where this jet boat is driven by an impeller, or a Berkeley jet pump that actually sucks water up from the lake, puts it through an impeller, and spits it out the back of the boat. And that's how the, this particular boat is driven down the water. What are we looking at as of weight and as of horsepower to this exact machine? Well, this particular boat is a top fuel jet boat. Um, it runs on nitromethane and puts out approximately 2,500 horsepower. What kind of speeds can I look for out of the blown fuel jets and ETs? Well, the blown fuel jets run right at around 150 miles per hour and run in the 690 to 710 ET range. Well, we've talked about the blown jets. I think it's time, uh, Dan, that we get these into the water and take a look at what this form of racing is all about. Well, Mike, we have the blown jets here. We've got Randy Fox in the left lane, smoking and stroking from Dallas, Texas. In the right lane, Doug Darnell, blown fever from Costa Mesa, California. This should be a really heads-up race. Okay, here we go. This is the blown jets that you're looking at on the starting line, and we are off the net. The capsules are down, and there they go. Both boats bouncing out of the hole. Looks like Darnell got a big hole shot on him. He looks like he's going to take an easy win here. Fox is coming on hard at the end, but Darnell looks like he's going to take the win. Randy Fox looks like he got an awful lot of air under his hull, and I guess that is common in this form of racing. Well, yeah, Mike, it is. That whole race right there was decided at the starting line. You may have noticed by now that some of the boats are equipped with capsules, others are not. For the boats without capsules, there are some life-saving measures that are put into effect. Bill, you want to tell us a little bit about what we're holding here? 
Well, Casey, the drivers who end up as about 95% of them still wear this jacket. If you're not in a capsule and you're sitting in an open boat, you want to wear a parachute jacket. It's designed so that if the boat would get out of shape and throw the driver out, there's a 12-foot parachute here that automatically deploys by hooking up this hook to the engine of the boat. When the driver leaves the boat seat, the parachute deploys, sets them in the water, feet first, decelerates them. This jacket's been around for over 20 years. It's been very, very successful in saving lives. One of the most dramatic pieces of video I think I've ever seen from boat races involved Ralph Padilla. It happened this time last year and a crash where he went tail over tea kettle to put it best. He survived it and he's back racing this year. He talked about that crash. Think back to the crash it was this time last year. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, it was, Mike. A uh, little bit different atmosphere, though, but uh, it was a great day, and uh, it came down to the championship between me and Ron, and uh, we went off first round right after the national anthem, and uh, unfortunately, to this day, we don't know if it was driver error or mechanical, but uh, we had an accident, and uh, I'm here to talk about it. Well, that, and that in itself is an amazing fact. The seconds when it happened, Ralph, I mean, it probably it may have seemed like a lifetime or been over in a flash of a second. What was running through your mind when you realized something went wrong? My first reaction was to get out of the capsule when I knew something went wrong and the, and the momentum had stopped me. My uh, brains were scrambled a little bit, but when I, uh, when I came to, so to speak, uh, my first reaction was to get out and uh, I did get out and proceeded to swim to the uh, bright Arizona sunshine and uh, here I am to tell you about it. Well, to me, Mike, it's like falling off a horse. You know, you fall off a horse and uh, uh, you look at yourself, you get up, dust off your pants, and you want to get back on it and prove to yourself that you can do it. Dan, just the fact that Ralph Padilla survived that crash tells me that the thought and the time and the efforts that have gone into the safety equipment have paid off. Well, Mike, you're looking right here at the rescue. I don't think if rescue was here, any of us would be on the water. We have high belief in these guys that if there is an incident, they'll be there for us. This is a whole team of volunteers. We have scuba divers, we have paramedics, we have two highly qualified boat drivers. If anything goes down, they'll have you out of the water and in an ambulance in less than two minutes. And if necessary, can even air vac you to the nearest hospital. Yes, and the race courses we race at that were far away from hospitals, in a matter of minutes, you're in personal uh, medical care. We're actually looking at the capsule from an F-16. These are what they implant into the bodies of these race boats that we see here. Talk about the capsule, the cost, and what it's all about. Well, Mike, you're looking right about oh, $8,000 to $10,000 installed in the boat. The capsules are made of hand-laid carbon fiber and Kevlar with a three-quarter inch chromoly tubing. The driver is strapped and secure, and he has a half an hour air supply. Mike, in a nutshell, these capsules are absolutely indestructible. Okay, this should be fun. The World Finals title is on the line. Ralph Padilla in quarter flash, caught in the act, will be driven by Steve Warner. It's only the second meeting ever of these two drivers. Mike, if you recall, in the first round of competition, Gary Kincaid and Top Gun hit the beach, and Ron Braxman Madness was disqualified. These two were the other semifinalists. That makes this race the final in Top Fuel Hydro. The capsules are down, the tree's lit. They should be putting them gear any second, and here we go. The top fuel final. Padilla's out, looks like a good start, they're side by side. Warner's off to a strong run, the boat's up high, look at the header flames coming out of the back of the boat, rooster tail. Side by side, looks like Warner might have took the win. I'll tell you, Dan, that's about as close as it gets. Let's take a look again. Steve Barner and Ralph Padilla. Padilla's boat powered by an Oldsmobile engine. Well, Mike, it was a very close race. I think it was one of the best fuel races I've seen in a long time. We have Steve Barner in the far lane, Ralph Padilla in the near lane. They both leave the starting rope belt at the same time. Both hit the throttles. It's a good side-by-side -side race. Look at Steve Barner's boat. It's up high. A beautiful rooster tail. Steve's really on a nice lap. Ralph's coming hard. It's a little too late. The official results. Steve Barner did take the win in a 5.57 ET at 212 miles per hour. Ralph Padilla was right there with a 5.85, 207 miles an hour. Mike, side by side, 200 miles an hour. It's unbelievable. And look at these guys after the race. Barner looking like he just went out for a Sunday stroll. From the expression on his face, you never know this guy just got out of the cockpit that was traveling at 200 miles an hour on water. Steve handles pressure real well. He's a calm, laid back guy. You can tell he's real happy right now. I'm sure Ralph Padilla just wants to congratulate him on a nice race. Well, Ralph Padilla himself, you've got to believe in the back of his mind somewhere he had to remember the crash that took place last year, the courage that it takes for this man to come to the start line and compete in the world finals. 
You've got to be curious about what these two finally said to each other when they met after the race. I could barely see you. I said, oh, man. I saw you in the lights, man, and I'm looking it over, and I'm, I'm where is he? And I'm going, man, it was close. Good race, it's man. Good, yeah. Next year. Me too. <laughs> you think Steve Varner was traveling fast? You should have seen my broadcast partner, Dan Nagy, run to the finish line. But he did, and he caught up with Steve, and here's what Varner had to say. That uh, race there with Ralph, was that was a tough one. I, I wish I could have saw Ronnie in the finals. That would have been uh, a really good race. Did you see Ralph at all when you left the line? Did you see him anywhere down the racetrack? Uh, I could barely see him out of the corner of my eye. I knew he cut a better light and bought half track. That was it. Did you know you won the race? Uh, yeah, I didn't see him at the end, so I knew we got across first, so I knew I didn't red light. Right now we're going to go down to KC, who is literally in the spirit of things. Kyle Walker is the guy that takes this machine down the water at 220 miles an hour. And let me tell you, just sitting in here is awesome. Kyle is going to take me through what the guys do when they get in, strap up, and uh, get ready to go. So, Kyle, you want to walk me through this? What's sure. the first thing that you do? First thing we do is we're going to put the belts on. What it's like to yeah, right. be strapped into this puppy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Woo. You getting, pull them on here, and you definitely thread them. getting goosebumps here. <laughs> you thread them all through there. Okay. Boy, There's I'm locked one to in. Keep you from going forward. Okay. We've got gauges down here. You cannot believe. Looks like 747. The next thing you do is you push this lever forward. This turns the fuel pumps on. Next, you reach down here. The button here is a clutch. And then all, then when it's rolling over, you throw the two mag switches, and it fires. So it, from the time that you start till the time that you finish uh, is about uh, eight seconds. So you just got to be flipping and, and uh, there's nothing to it. So he says, right? Okay, uh, we're going to put this cockpit down over my head and give me a true feeling of what this is sure. like here. Okay. Got it? We're gonna start it up. Right. Ah! Okay, what do we do here? All right. Step on the starter button up there. And ready? drop the throttle. I didn't step on the throttle. He told me it was going to explode if I stepped on the throttle. So my, my knee is just about up to my chin here. I'm going to stay away from that puppy. Whoa, that was incredible. Thanks, Casey. I'll tell you what we got for you now. A good old-fashioned grudge match, and I mean that literally. Kyle Walker and Ron Braxma have decided to have, if nothing else, a gentleman's race. They're going to come out here with the two fastest boats in the world and go head-to-head -head in what they call a grudge match. And at stake is good old-fashioned nitro. It's hard to come by these days. It's very expensive, $55 a gallon. They can use up 10 gallons on a run. So, Dan, this is the grudge match. Well, you're right, Mike. We have the f two fastest boats in the world here. Yeah. And these Left are about two of the favorite boats here in the world. The fans just love Ron Broxman's right Boat Madness, Kyle Walker, and Spirit of America. 
Um, these two guys have been running each other all year long. It should be a good showdown. We got the lights. We're getting ready to go here. All right, the staging lights are on, and we are set to race. And this is nothing more than a grudge match with Nitro on the line. So here we go, Dan. Call it. The boats are in gear. Looks like Ronnie got out first. Looks like Ronnie took a whole shot. Kyle Walker coming on hard in the big end. Look at this. Walker going around in the big end. What a big win it looked like for Kyle Walker. So Kyle Walker, and he, of course, is in the spirit of America, up against Ron Braxma in Madness. And uh, we're going to show you a replay. This had good written all over it, actually. This is a nice shot here, Mike, an aerial view. You can see the boats are side by side, coming to the tree. Ronnie's out front a little bit. And, oh, look at the rooster tail. It's beautiful. A lot of horsepower. You're looking at about 6,000 horsepower going down the water right there. Side by side, I'd bet you, Mike, that's over 200 miles an hour on each side. Absolutely. Combined speed of well over 400 miles an hour. Well, Mike, it's unfortunate. We're looking at another replay here. Ron Broxton, the reason why he looked like he got out first, it was a red light, a DQ'd run. So the wind goes to Kyle Walker with a 549, 215 miles an hour. Ron Broxman goes through the 572, 208. Side by side, over 200 miles an hour. So Kyle Walker doesn't go home with the trophy, but he does go home with some extra nitro. Broxma and Walker going toe-to-toe -to -toe down the stretch in what they call the grudge match now here in Phoenix, Arizona. And Casey, I'm curious how the fans felt about that little match we just saw. Did you have a good day? Had a great day. A lot of fun. Who's your favorite? Uh, Ron. Breckman with Madness. And he, and he just about made it. Yeah, God, we were pulling for him. Uh, great day, a lot of fun out here. Good racing, uh, good folks. Do you know there's a grudge match going on here? Yes, I did. I want Spirit of America to win that one. Did you have fun today? Yes. Do you come out of these races very often? No, this is a first. What'd you think? I loved it. Drag racing is the top. NASCAR, Indy, no way. Drag boats. All you folks out here having a good time? Well, that was it. That was the match race for the day. That was Madness and Spirit of America. Thank you, Casey. What a great race. Roxma and Walker side by side. I think the fans really enjoyed that one. Now let's take a look at the IHBA World Finals class winners. The 1991 World Finals have drawn to a conclusion. An interesting day of racing, to say the least. But your final thoughts? Well, Mike, it was a very interesting day. We had a full field of top fuel hydros today. And some of our heavy hitters went out in first round. It was very interesting. The fans, I think, really had a good time. I had a great time, personally. And the word is the top fuel hydros next year will be expanded. Maybe as many as 16 boats. Well, Mike, possibly in our next race, we might see a 16-boat field, which makes our world champion, four-time world champion, Ron Broxma, very nervous. And it makes the World Finals next year all that more exciting. So for Dan Nagy and for KC Winkler, I'm Mike Chamberlain. Thanks for joining us in Phoenix, Arizona at Firebird International Raceway. Bye-bye, everybody.